fact that, you know, whether you're white or black, you can sit in judgment in this case. You can be impartial. But yet race still keeps coming up. Um, I, I would have to say, and I want to know if you agree with me, by bringing up Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter, it's almost just a litmus test for the attorneys to see kind of where you stand on the race issue. Yes, that, that's an excellent way to phrase it. However, I have to admit I don't agree with it, and I'll say a little bit why. Yes, they're trying to get these people to talk, and yes, they want them to share what they really feel about these issues. And if you start with a question in a manner that suggests that you just want to shallow share, well, how do you feel about Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives? They're clearly, because of the phrase and the way it's written, you're going to say, well, of course they matter. And you're hearing that a lot. Yes, Black Lives Matter, of course. Blue Lives Matter, too. Everybody's life matters. That's not what you want to know. What you want to know is do some lives matter more than others? And do you feel that way? And do you think that some lives have more value than others? And do you or can you make room for the possibility that there are some people in the police department who don't see it that way at all and that the only lives that really matter are their own? Because this is the root of what's going on. And until you start asking real questions designed to reveal real answers as opposed to just having something to say, you're going to have this round around that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you on that point. And, you know, what's interesting is, and, and I agree with your point you made earlier, that, any again, anyone can be impartial. But I think there's more impartial and less impartial. I want to play a quick shot. This was juror number nine. Um, she's mixed race or identifies as mixed race. And she talks about something that I think is very interesting. So I want to play this, and then we'll discuss it. Here it is. Do you believe your community has been negatively or positively affected by any of the protests that have taken place in the Twin Cities area since Mr. Floyd's death? And I said somewhat positive, right? Correct. Um, yeah, I think just in the idea of recognizing that some people are unfortunately discriminated against and it is a thing that happens. And so just positive in the sense of just like awareness, pretty much, because I mean, I'm sure seeing something like that was some people's first like visual of being like, oh, this somebody's been discriminated against. I've actually never seen that. So I didn't know it was a real thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just in the sense of for the first time, some people might have seen that something bad can happen to somebody because they look or are a certain way. Now, she, she makes a great point that, you know, this, this case and what happened in that nine-minute video might have really opened some eyes. And I think from listening to some of the other jurors, you get the sense that maybe some eyes were opened by what happened here, that they can see that there's something wrong there in the relationship between, let's say, the black community and the blue community in, in, around the country, but specifically in Minneapolis. Now, as an attorney, how important is it that you get a juror to understand that discrimination does in fact take place? Or is that not important at all? Or at the end of the day, are we going to leave all of that stuff outside the courtroom and just go on the basis of that video and the facts? No, it's incredibly important. That is the entire case, if you will, in a civil rights case, in a civil rights trial. The case is won or lost with jury selection, with law dearer. And you have got to find people who can embrace the idea that our constitutional rights apply to all of us, none of us. And many of them won't even know this or haven't thought about it. So they don't have to come in to the courtroom preloaded with that commitment. But you have to get them to a point where they can decide whether that's important to them or not. Most people will trade safety for um, freedom. A good number of people prefer a lot more freedom and safety, and most of us are somewhat balanced in between. But there have been a lot of good men and women who have given their lives, their limbs, their health, their family, so that we would have these civil rights, these constitutional rights. But why don't they apply when you come back to the States? And why don't they apply to that man with his knee on that person's neck? Why isn't he getting it? What gives him the right to decide when we get rights and when we don't, just because he went to a police academy for 12 weeks? This is what people have to fight for. Our rights apply to all of us or none of us. 
You made an, an incredible point, and I wish I could have articulated it myself. People will trade safety for freedom. They absolutely will. And it's interesting because one of the questions that the attorneys keep asking is this idea that, do you feel safe in your neighborhood? It's about defunding the police. And when they're in your neighborhood, do you feel safe? And that safety, you are exactly right, is probably more important to people than any of these freedoms for those other people that we're talking about. Yes, that's uh, what they really need to be getting at. Now, you've heard some of the folks who maybe were saying that blue lives really matter. I mean, what are they really saying when they're saying that? Saying, well, I want someone to stand up for who I identify with, which is the power structure, or which are the police. You had another person say, well, I think it's really important that they not be second-guessed because it's a tough job. My response to that, Jerry, would have sounded like this. Let me see if I get this right, sir. As long as the police are the one making the decisions, no matter how bad they are, so, since they were uh, in uh, doing their job, therefore they have the power to do whatever they want. And you're okay with that. Just want to make sure that's what you're saying, because that's what I just heard. Now you'll hear that juror back up and start going him and all. But that's exactly what that juror is saying. And here's why. Here's the key. That juror is saying, because it, they would never do that to me. That juror has no idea in his head that that would ever happen to him. And therein lies the entire problem, because he's exactly right. <laughs> that's got to get yeah. fixed. No question. Unless we're all free, no one's free, but they don't necessarily care about that, as you said. And, and the other thing is, you know, it's very difficult, um, and, and you can tell me from your perspective, and, and we talked about it about the other juror who had gone to Iraq. It was easy for him to stand in the boots of police officers. But when you ask civilians who haven't carried a gun, who haven't been in those dangerous situations, to now stand in the, in the boots of a police officer, hard to have them then make judgment on them in difficult situation. Yes, what you're really asking them to do is to uh, judge those who you have been raised to believe are there to protect you. If you've been raised in a household where you must respect authority at all times, then you're just going to acquiesce to whatever the uh, power tells you to do. And usually when you're raised that way, you're led to believe that they would never harm you, that they're, they like you, and then they're, they're here for you. Great. What happens when you get raised in a neighborhood where it's open season on you by those people in the power structure? And that they intentionally, constantly either um, abuse you or use you or run you through the system because they don't like you. And they're actually paid to do that. You're going to have a much different view on this whole thing. And this is, again, what the problem is, is that you have two different worlds trying to fit in the same small space. And the only way to change that is by great change across how the officers are picked, how they're screened, psychological profiles, how they're trained, and mostly who has to be held accountable when they can't act right, think right, or make the right judgments because they don't want to. And this settlement, $27 million, which to me is a joke, that's the difference between a settlement and taking it to trial, the individual should have to pay for that. In this case, the insurance is paying for it, the bankers. How come the police chief didn't take any out of his pocket and take a pay cut? How come the officers themselves didn't have to pay a nickel of that? Why is that? How are you going to get any change when the bankers are the ones who are going to pay for it? It didn't cost you a thing. It's time to change it. Personal accountability is the only kind of way. Yeah, absolutely. No question. That's been the criticism of those settlements over the years. And another little tidbit I'll throw out there before we go to break is that in Minneapolis, the police union has negotiated to the point where even if Derek Chauvin is convicted of a felony here, he still gets his full pension. So that'll tell you a yeah. little bit about what's going on here. All right, Joseph Lowe, the fun is just beginning. I want you to stand by. We do have to take a break. This week, we've watched both sides interview.